GTS Garage. Um, this episode is going to be about uh, the 16,000 mile service. So as part of building the bike, a lot of the 16,000 mile service or uh, a service that occurs every two years is going to naturally occur. So it's to do with the brake fluids, it's to do with the greasing of um, the swing arm, it's to do with the steering head bolt. It's all those parts where you normally have to disassemble quite in depth, apply grease and reapply unless you need to change it out. A lot of that is going to be done because I'm rebuilding the bike from scratch. Um, the things that aren't going to get done is kind of the engine wise. So one of the areas that we're going to, so we've already done the clutch, the last episode we actually fixed the clutch rail, and this way we're going to look at the shims, now the, or the valve clearances. Basically the valve clearance comes under the fact that it's part of the engine, and right from the beginning I said that I wasn't really going to start messing around with the engine on the basis that I didn't want to do too much to the point where I couldn't get it to start when I put the bike back together. Um, but valve clearances, there is, there is a lot of resources on YouTube, there's a lot of resources on the internet full stop that show you how to measure the tolerances of your valve uh, clearances and also how to change them out fairly cheaply without expensive tools or anything like that. So this is a job I feel that you are able to do at home, you are able to do yourself quite economically, you just need the time and the patience and some very very basic tools. So what I'm going to do now is go through the tools that you're going to need to do the job. The first tool you're going to need to do the job is going to be, uh, you're going to need a feeler gauge. And basically these are cheapest chips, so about £3 on flea bait. Um, you can take, the, these normally come in a larger set, there's normally about 50 or 60 of these. Because um, the range of tolerances between each of the shims is so small, I've got the gauges from 4 to 25 and that's, that's going to be the maximum they are. That's the maximum they can be and that's the minimum they can be. And that'll stop you having to shuffle through 60 odd shims just trying to get more, 60 odd feelers trying to get the right one. So that's one thing that I've done to make my life a little bit easier than it was. So that's the first tool. The second tool you are going to need is going to be a very blunt, thin screwdriver. And that's because the shims sit on top of a, uh, they sit on top of a bucket. And that bucket creates a vacuum. And you will need that to prise the shim off of the bucket. So very thin and it needs to be blunt. There's no, you don't want to score the shims in any shape or form. So we use something that's blunt. The next thing you may need, and some will say no, no, and the others will say I use it all the time, but the manual also says to use it, and that is a magnet, and that's one of the easiest way um, to get hold of the shim and to pull it out safely. That's the other tool. The other thing you are going to need is a 14mm socket to turn or to crank the uh, to crank mechanism, and that will move the shims up and down. Um, and allow you to gain access to measure and change. So it's a 14mm uh, socket there. Um, you will also need a pair of small pliers. Um, so none of these tools are very expensive. You should have them lying around the house or if you do any type of maintenance tasks, you're going to have these. You don't need to go out and buy anything special. But if you need to change them, and we will be working on the assumption that I will be changing mine, you will also need a plastic tie and it's a zip tie like this and, you, and there's plenty of YouTube videos showing you how to use that but that's one of those and you will need one of those. Okay, um, so they're the tools you're going to need. The next stage is let's take a look at the engine and take a look at the areas that you're going to need access to. There are basically eight shims that we need to, um, to measure and maybe replace. So working this way up, we have intake one, intake two, intake three, and intake four. We have exhaust one, exhaust two, exhaust three, exhaust four. Now as we can move those up and down and we start to take measurements, there will be a point where we need to replace them. When we use to replace them, we use, from starting from intake one and exhaust one, we use spark plug one. Exhaust, intake two and exhaust two, we use spark plug hole two. For, and so forth. So obviously it's going to be intake three, exhaust three, and then we use spark plug three, and then last but not least, we use the four. Okay, this is basically the crank wheel that we'll be using to bring the shims up and down in their respective places so we can gain access to them. There is one point of interest on the entire, on the entire crank, and that is that T right there. Now there are two alignments on here. 
One is above the T and the other one is on this black case here. And your position one is going to be when that T and that, that line there are in alignment. Once they are in alignment, if you come back up here, you can look at intake one and exhaust one, they will be facing away from one another. That means you are now ready to take your first reading just on intake one and exhaust one. You take, the, you take that reading fairly simply, and what I'll do is I'll run through a couple with you, but it's self-explanatory really, to be honest. So once I've done one, you'll know. It's, once you get the, feel, the, the gauge part of it is fairly simple, it's going to be the turns of the crank that get a little bit complicated, and I'll show you why. So with intake one, the intake one is labelled intake one, and it's labelled intake four. So one, two, three, four, self-explanatory, and it's exactly the same with the exhaust. So with the two uh, crank, uh, sorry, with the two um, crankshafts pointing away from one another like this, we will take the first reading. This should be no greater. The thickness should be no greater than a 0 0.15 mil. So that's what we're dealing with. We put it through, it's snug, it's a bit tight, so we know that it's not exceeded the maximum. So it's most likely going to be a 13, probably a 13. And when I take the 13, I can slide it in there with very little resistance. So that one's intolerance. This one, the maximum is going to be 25, so you may as well jump straight to the 25. And that's too tight, which is a good thing. So we come back down to, um, let's start with a 23, too tight, we start with a 20, just a bit tight, but to be honest that is going to be a little bit snug, so we'll go for an 18, and that is just about right. So this one is out of tolerance, so we drop those, drop those two, two numbers down, down, and then you come back to the crankcase. And what we are going to do is we're going to move the crank case, we're going to move the crank mechanism um, 180 degrees. So we are going to just move it around 180 degrees and we are going to stop when that tab is in the same position. So it's done. And you'll notice now that the T is uh, uh, away from where it's marked and that is just marked there. So if you come back up now you will notice that the shim 2 or intake 2 and exhaust 2 have now moved into a similar position where they're pointing away from each other. So we once again get the gauge, which I'm going to work on with Ying 15. I'll start with a 13 this time. 13 is snug, so I know it's going to be within tolerance because it's going to be about 11 or a 12. And this one is going to be, might as well start with a 25. Too tight, which, you, which is a good thing. We then start to go to a 23. And down. Nope, still not in. We go to a 20. And that's tight. So we know this one's also going to be out of tolerance. And it's going to be about a 19 or an 18. Okay, so um, then this is the only strange part of when you turn the crank, and this is the part you've got to be. The next crank, if we come round again, you're turning it counterclockwise, and again you're turning it 180 degrees. So this time the T is going to line up. And if you come up here, you will now see that actually it's position four that has moved into the correct position. And that is, I don't know why, but that is they measure one, two, four, and then it's three. So we're now measuring four the same way as we measured one and two. Um, so if I just quickly, for demonstration purposes, do that, too tight. It's a 20, snug. It's going to be an 18, it's perfect. And on the other side, it's going to be, let's go for a middle ground, 13. And let's go for a 10. It's perfect. So I know it's between 10 and 13. So basically, 
That is how you take the, uh, the measurements of each of the one. And I'll show you for completeness. I will show you the crank once more. Again, you crank 180 degrees anti-clockwise. So it's basically there. And now you see your intake three and your exhaust three are in the right position for measuring. That is it should be doing. Dun, 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 is creating yourself a chart. What you should be doing is creating yourself a chart like this. So basically you've got um, intake one and uh, exhaust one, one, two, three and four. You've got I for intake, E for exhaust, SI for shim intake, SE for shim exhaust and we'll go on to that next. But every time you take a reading, you put it in the relative common, uh, in the relative column. Basically, once you have that information, you then have to go to a Haynes manual, or you can go to a an online resource like a forum, and it will tell you what the the standards are for each, or the tolerances are for your bike. Now, as I said, this one is between 11 and 15 for the intake, and it's between 21 and 25 for the exhaust. So you can see that one's intake one is in, intake two is in, intake three is out quite a bit and intake four is out quite a bit. Um, exhaust one is out, uh, exhaust two is out, exhaust three is in tolerance, exhaust four is out of tolerance. So as you can see only two of mine are in tolerance, two or three of mine are in tolerance and I have a fair few to exchange. So the next part is going to be to remove the, uh, the shims. Now the reason why we remove shims, on the back of each shim, there is a number to be able to make up the deficit or to be able to reduce the amount of tolerance there is there. So as we've already said, I mind, several of mine are out of tolerance and I need, the shim, I need the number on the back of the shims to be able to work out what the new shim should be. So to do this, I'm going to use my plastic tool. Now as I said a lot of people will be saying no no you're not allowed to do that but it works for me and it has worked in the past so I'm going to show you how I do it. So the first thing to do now is what we will work on number one and um, let me just see if number one's needed. Number one on the exhaust is needed so we're going to take this shim out here so what I need to do first of all is to crank that shim until it is round and it is fully I want to leave it there. And then I'm going to go through exhaust, uh, sorry, to spark plug. I'm going to go inside spark plug one. And I'm going to turn it. And I'm hoping, now th I'm not lying, this is going to be a finicky business and can take several attempts before it gets right. But you hopefully not too long because I don't want this video to run in two hours and then I'm going to raise the the bucket again and hopefully the bucket will catch so we're now the bucket's coming up on. but I believe that that is no so it doesn't always work as we've described so now I need to go around again and you basically use, if you're doing, if you're replacing both, it's nice and easy because when one is up, one is down. So for every, for every 180 degree turns you do, you get to do two. But if you're only after one, then it becomes a bit of a bodgery because you have to keep turning it all the way around to depress it. So that's what I would call now as depressed. I'm going to fit. Okay. So finally I managed to get it to go in. Basically the, the, the cable tie has actually stopped the, um, has stopped, not the basket, has stopped the bucket from coming back up with it. And you'll notice now there is a space between the wheel itself and the top of the shim. And we're able to exploit that, that space to actually get the shim out. So the first thing to do is to get that in and to loosen the shim as you can see. Can you see in there? Okay, so basically we've lifted it with the screwdriver, we go in with the magnet, we take it out like that. 
Okay, so basically this going down, you'll see now there is a number on it which is 262. Two. And that's the number that we jot down. And this is exhaust number four. Now to put these back in is exactly the opposite. We just slide that back in as such. And then we just push the magnet and we just push that back in and that should now seat and as we turn the engine that you will hear that click into place you could just keep on that for me and you will hear that click into place so as it goes back round again I shall move that out of the way as it goes back round again you will hear that click and then that will seat 262 was it 262? It was. <laughs> right, and that's it clicking back into place. Now I'm going to write that number down because I'm going to forget it. 262 on uh, exhaust number so four. basically guys, that is all there is to it. It's about taking the, the valve cover off. It's about having the right tools which aren't that expensive. It's about getting stuck in. Measuring isn't a problem. Um, I can understand why some people may be a little bit nervous about the cable tie method, but it's worked for me and I was nervous to begin with. As I said, I completely wrote this off as something that I wouldn't want to get involved in. I was happy to do the measuring and I was going to get somebody else to actually change them out for me. But if I can do it, anybody can do it. It's not that hard. It is finicky and your probably its success rate is probably about one in seven. So it can be quite time consuming. thing to do is, when you've had enough, is understand when your, frustration, when your frustration levels are getting high and it is walking away, having a cup of tea, sit down, watch a bit of TV and then come back to it. At the end of the day, there's no rush for this unless this is your, you know, if this is your bike that you're riding to and from work, then obviously you want to get it done over a weekend. That's fine, but what you don't want to do is give yourself an hour and a half to do it and expect to be able to get it done. You probably will, but as soon as that frustration, as soon as you miss two or three of those lips and it doesn't come up and you're just permanently going round and round, frustration can build. So I would advise at that point you just walk away, have a cup of tea, come back, and you will find it. You will find it fairly easy. It's not a stressful. Uh, it's not a, a stressful procedure to do. So. What that gives me now is it's given me the measurements, it's given me the, the numbers on the back of the shim so now I can go away and I can order the correct ones. Um, basically the way you can tell the correct ones is you use the, the back every 16,000 miles. So basically it's part of the, the, the Haynes manual for this, for this bike. It gives you the 16,000 mile service and on the back of that it tells you what the shim should be every 16,000 miles. So it gives you the standard one for both the intake and the exhaust. And you basically look where your tolerances are, then you go along until you see the number that it is. Then you go down and it gives you the new shim number. You go away, you get that new shim number, and then you do exactly the same. You basically use the tie method, you go down the correct um, spark plug hole, you bring that, you, you trap the bucket, you bring the shim up, you're able to remove the old shim and you're able to put the new shim back in. Um, okay, before I finish, I should have given a, a word and I will put this at the beginning of the video. It is absolutely imperative, and I, I've used that hopefully in the right context, it is most important that you do not remove a shim and then turn the crank handle. Do not lower the shim bucket back into the engine without having the shim in it. Um, I don't know what happens, but I have been told that <laughs> I have been told it is the worst thing you could possibly do. So don't do it. Make sure you take the shim out, you read the number, you put the shim with the number face down back into the bucket, you lower it down so the shim comes down, then you remove the cable tie. It is a simple, you've just got to take it easy, take it slowly, and as soon as the frustration comes in, you walk away and you come back. And there is nothing difficult to that job. I hope that helps you out, lads. You take care of yourself, and I shall see you next time. Take care. GTS Garage out. Yeah.